Hello everyone, my name is Alison Rendell and welcome to my Shetland knitting class for 2021. Thanks to those of you who are joining me today and to all of you who are coming back from last year's class. So later in the class we're going to be looking at edging and ribbing. Um, but first, before we move on to that, I would like to explain a bit more about how Shetlanders typically use three double pointed needles, a knitting belt and no written pattern as such when they're creating a garment. We tend to work out the number of loops, as we call them, or stitches um, that we need for the, for the total round number in a garment and then we choose fair isle motifs to fit into that round number to keep your pattern continuous. In most Shetland families somewhere you will find a dotted graph book and I have a couple to show you today. So most of these graph books have been passed down through generations of knitters. So the first book I have to show you today belongs to my mother. Uh, she started dotting out these graphs about 60 years ago when she was a teenager and a lot of the patterns that she, that she copied were from her mother and her grandmother. So that makes them quite old. So it's things like this. Um, this is a Shetland all over pattern, which would be really nice in a, in a Gansey or something like that. And she also has like written notes on this side with her colours, ideas and her calculations. So it, it's like a working notebook and a record of the patterns that we use. Um, I noticed one here that she'd done obviously much later when felt pens came into use. She'd done one in colour here. And then we have some piri patterns here, a selection of, of the nine row piri patterns. And these ones are single motifs that are useful for the back of a the pattern on the back of a hand of a glove. And then she has, as I say, written notes at the side. That's about how to knit a hat and this one is, is how she does her gloves. So it's really like a working notebook. And some of the patterns she'll have used, some of them she'll not have ever knitted, some of them have been half started and then not finished. It's obviously well loved and used and been very patched up with old yellow sellotape. Um, so the second book I have today is from an elderly lady in her 90s. Um, and she and her son have allowed me to share this book with you today. Uh, what's so special about this book is that the patterns in this book came from, a lot of them came from the lady's cousin, who was about 30 years older than her. So that dates these patterns back to the early 1900s. Um, we just have a look inside here. It's a similar thing. Here we have single ferrile motifs. And the other thing that's special about this book is that a lot of the patterns in here are similar to my mother's book. Um, and interestingly, both of these ladies hail from Coningsborough. And that really goes to show how patterns were passed from craft to craft within communities before better transport connections led the patterns being spread further afield. So women would have spent hours dotting these out with no technology to make the process quicker. Um, going back to the book, there's, as I say, there's familiar ones in here that, that my mother used as well. And then I noticed here there was some new ones where are they yeah these ones new ones to me that i've never seen before and i also noticed here as i was saying before patterns that have been started and not finished and other ones that have been scribbled out 
So this lady had a previous pattern book that had fallen apart and is no longer being used and she rewrote this one in 1972. So these um, feral motifs have survived countless fashion trends and over the years they started off being knitted in limited numbers of hand dyed colours and then we went through the more vibrant colours in the 60s and 70s where in the advent of synth synthetic yarns and really bright colours, sometimes occasionally a bit garish. Um, and now we've kind of come full circle to 100% pure Shetland wool again, but in hundreds of shades to choose from. JNS have many natural and dyed shades to choose from enabling you to give enough of a contrast between your foreground and your background and also giving you lots of scope for grad gradation of the colours, graduation of the colours and enabling you to have really limitless colour combinations in your knitting. So the elderly lady that lent me this book was a prolific knitter in her day, all sorts of things she would have knitted but from a very young age she knitted the gloves to sell with the patterned fingers and the patterned cuffs and she would knit them in no time at all. These are a pair that I've made but anyone else who's tried it will know the construction in the fingers. It takes a long time and you need a lot of patience but the, the, the older knitters seem to just make them in no time. So that is the graph books. We're now ready to move on to the second half of my class, which is talking about edging and ribbing. The most common type of ribbon is single colour. It's still a really useful ribbon. It's very stretchy, it doesn't curl, and it can be used effectively in the brim of a hat or the basque of a jumper. Um, you can do it in knit two, purl two, or you can do knit one, purl one. The downside is that it can be a bit tedious and slow. And myself, and I'm sure many other Shetland knitters, we really enjoy our colour work, but we find the ribbon a slightly boring bit to do, and none of us seem to really like doing all that purl stitches. So Shetlanders with machine knitting skills, not me as yet, but they sometimes knit the ribbing on the machine and then they can graft it onto their colour work to, to speed up the process. As a general rule, you need to increase your stitches by about 25% when you transition from ribbing to colour work. That is to keep your ribbon nice and tight and springy and the body, the main body of your colour work looser. So I have a, just an example of single colour ribbon here and um, these are not mine, these are ones I was given and interestingly this ribbing is done in knit two purl one which I presume was to reduce the number of, of purl stitches but it's, it's a lovely, as I say, effective springy stretchy rib. So two coloured ribbing. Two coloured ribbon is more interesting, makes for a more interesting garment and it is what I most commonly knit. Um, it has less stretch so you actually start with more stitches so that means when you do your transition from the ribbing into the colour work, color work you only need to increase your stitches maybe by about 15%. So you can introduce a contrast in colour in two colour ribbon, a colour that was going to be used later in your garment, um, or several as I've done here, several of the colours that are going to be used. I like to shade from dark to light and then back out to dark again. I try to achieve a sort of glow in the middle. 
Um, in Shetland knitting, most things are done very symmetrically. So if you, what you do in the first half is mirrored in the second half. It is obviously okay to break this rule as knitting is all about creativity, but it is not traditional to do so. So here you can see two coloured rib with the shading in the, in the purl stitches and here in this one I've done the same shading in the purl stitches but I've also added a small bit of shading in the knit stitches as well. So that's two of my, my v-neck jumpers there. So I'm going to move on to concealed ribbon now. Um, the beauty of the concealed ribbon is that you maintain the pattern and design on the outside but you have the snugness of ribbing on the inside. So what this does is gives you that tightness around your wrist, it gives you a double layer of wool for warmth and structure and as you can see when you turn up the cuff there your your ribbon is your ribbon is all hidden and you have a nice sort of collar around your wrist as it is as it is single color ribbon as i said before you need to decrease your stitches for the ribbing and then increase them again for the color work those are my vagolin mitts which many of you have been knitting this is also my recently released pattern the filska bonnet and it's got um, the patterned brim around the, around the baby's face and then inside the concealed ribbon which keeps it nice and snug fit and which you kind of need in the Shetland wind you can ensure that your hat's going to stay on nice and sn snugly and again a few of you have been knitting bonnets like these So, I'm moving on now to, to the Pico edging. So these are my Freda's mitts, these are called, and I've knitted them in a variety of colours here. So this gives you a little fluted edge and you do away with ribbon altogether. It's not without its um, fiddly bits to make, but you don't have to do any purl stitches here at all. And I have an example here now that I'm going to show you how to do it. So what you do here is a little band of stock and stitch. I've done about five rows here. And then you create an eyelet row, which is just basically a row of holes. And then you repeat the same number of stock and stitch rows and then when you fold it under, as you can see, it's quite m magically creates a, a nice little edge that looks a bit like a pie crust. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is um, join this together. So what I'm doing now is I fold that edge underneath and I'm going to join the stitches together to create the edge. So you basically go into your front stitch and you line up the corresponding stitch at the back. It is a bit tricky to do. Uh, you hook into something in the back and knit that stitch and then come through this one as well. And that's how you join your edge. So it's not critical what stitch you pick up on the back because your back will not be seen but it is important to keep it lined up so that your edge is nice and straight. So I'll just do that again into the front, pick up something in the back, knit the back stitch and take it through the front and then your edge becomes joined and you just go all the way around in this fashion. It's the first stitches are the tricky ones and the end ones are tricky. But you'll get into a rhythm in the middle and it's not too bad, just take your time. And it does make a worthwhile edge and something just a bit different as well.
So the next thing I'm moving on to talk about is pattern in the ribbon. And I've been doing a quite a bit of experimenting with that. So it is possible to create pattern in your ribbon. It's, um, it does have a tendency to curl and it's got slightly less stretch than normal ribbon, so it can be hard to get it right. But as I say, I've been doing a bit of experimenting with this. So here we have um, a hat done with this section of the ribbon and it's interspersed with patterns in between sections of ribbon and it seems to have worked quite well. And then this design I did using moss stitch for the, for the main band of ribbon and then I put in a small band of pattern in the middle which picks up the, des the design later on in the hat and it just creates a bit of variation. And then this Gansey I knitted last year in the pandemic, it was something to, to distract me. I sat outside whenever I could in the summer and knitted on this. And here I've done a bit of shaded ribbing and a small five row pattern in the middle and then back to the ribbon and it seems to have worked okay as well. As I said, it sometimes can curl. My own personal technique for things that curl is to steam the garment and then just weight it under a couple of heavy books and that seems to do the trick. So I've also tried to do this thing which I call kind of offset ribbing and again it's just for a bit something a bit different. So um, you can do it in knit to purl two for a couple of rows and then your next couple of rows you move the stitches uh, sideways almost so you'll be doing your knit stitches over the top of your previous purl ones. So it creates the look of tiny squares similar to a checkerboard effect. You can also do it in one and one as well. So that's what I've done here is knit two, purl two and then move them on the next rows. And that's again just an idea to try. This is my um, Jorgvin berry. It's a pattern that's coming out this year sometime. So here is one of the tunic dresses I knitted. And what I've done here is again try to create the, the tiny square look. But I did this by keeping the knitted column, the knitted stitches in a column and the purl stitches are here. But created the square look by using blue colours, little blue squares. So we're, we're getting to the end of the basket. Um, the next thing I was going to mention was um, horizontal bands. So this is just, this, these is, are my worset rivelin patterns. A rivelin is a homemade Shetland shoe from the Crofton period when they used to be made with seal skin and cowhide and then just laced onto your foot. Uh, but I made these woolly versions just to wear around the house. And what I did here, instead of picking up all your stitches to do your ribbon, I made this ribbon and, and you attach it the same way as you would do a cardigan button band. Um, so to achieve this look, you cast on your, well here I've cast on five stitches. And um, you knit your ribbon as you go and when you get to your last stitch, you're, you're knitting together here and knit so that you're attaching it as you go. And I'll just show you that now. So I always um, slip the first stitch. That way you get a neat and decorative edge. If you were knitting all your outside stitches, it would be a bit loose and uneven. So slip the first one. And then we're doing a ribbon, which is purl, knit, purl, and then back to your knit stitch. And I go to the other end of my needle 
pick up one here and then I knit the two together. Now that's how I do it with double pointed needles. I have no idea how you would manage with any other type of wires. And then you go to your back, uh, the reverse side and knit along the back. And then you're ready again to do exactly the same thing. Knit across these and pick up your next one. So because you're knitting two rows for every pick up, you actually pick up every, rather than every stitch, you pick up every second one. So again, that creates a nice tight band around your foot. So that's my worset rivlings. Um, so the last thing I want to discuss today is Latvian braids. So that's not a Shetland technique, but they do make, they complement the Fair Isle knitting, I feel, as both these knitting techniques come from similar related traditions, really. So I think that the, the two-coloured braid gives an interesting and sort of striking decorative band I've used it here as a single band to, between the ribbon and the main pattern and the crown and it just makes it more interesting. And then on this pattern, this is a small mobile phone case that I made for my daughter's phone and here I've used three rows of the Latvian braiding and that again does away with any need for ribbon at all because it actually is gripping the phone quite well. So this pattern incorporates a few of the techniques that we've discussed today. It's going to be made available as a free pattern from today, which you can download, and it will be for a limited time as a free pattern. It's a useful knit for a beginner who maybe wants a small project to start with. It's also really useful just to knit up as a quick gift for somebody. That's a quick look at alternate edging and ribbing ideas. The aim today was to showcase some of the many different techniques that you can use to create variation in your work and just keep it lively and just keep yourself interested. Anyone who joined my class last year will know that I'm a fan of the poetry of the late T.A. Robertson who wrote under the name of Vagaland. He wrote poems about Shetland's past and a lot of his writing is very evocative of my Shetland heritage which is why I love the poetry. So I'm going to leave you today with another couple of verses from one of his poems and it's called Mini, Mini Spicks. So I'll just read this to you now. When I was young, folk rocked with Spencers and muckle tick socks and worset slips, for by the haps, white, black and shela, and some of them grey we murret strips. They would sit for hours at the fire chic makin and big on clods for a better licht, and mak a sock as they carried a kishi, and ging we a sock about the nicht. So if you'd like me to try and translate that a bit, it's talking here about Spencer's, which is a traditional Shetland woolen undergarment used as a vest. And it's also talking about muckle tick socks, which is big thick socks, and worset slips, which again is a woolen vest. For by all the haps, which is the square Shetland shawls, made in white, black and shela, which is all Shetland natural colours, and some of them grey with murret strips. Murret is a natural brown colour from a sheep. They would sit for hours at the fire chic marking, that means just right by the cheek of the fire, and big on clods, which is um, Shetland peat. Uh, so you would put on, on your fire, you would use what we call the blue clods, which is the, the ones that give you the biggest flame in the fire. And that was so that they could see better if you had a nice bright fire. And it also says here about making a sock as they carried a kishi, 
Well, all Shetland knitting was, is called a sock, really. It's just tack your sock means to bring your knitting along. And they would knit as they were going, carrying a kishi, which is this. So the women would fill their kishi with the peats um, and carry them home to put them on the fire and they would have to knit as they go. Um, and ging a sock about the night, which is what I was saying before, that people would go along each other's houses, bring their knitting and possibly their pattern books, their graph books, and go to each other's houses to knit about the night. So that's basically what a translation of the poem, what it means. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson and thank you very much for joining me. Thanks.